Okay, welcome to Spine Conference. Today's discussion will be on spondylolysis. And this lecture will be catered to more on the side of the novice orthopedic surgeon or physician. I have with me here today, Christina. Hi. So the flowers are for springtime. So spondylolysis, it's a complicated word, right? Spondylo means spine. Lysis means pulled apart or fractured. Spondylo spine again. Lysis means sliding. The bones are sliding. Spondylo means what? Spine. And cis means something's just wrong with it. Spondyl spondylosis. Isthmus, we're going to go over it. And pars articularis is the place between two joints. So lysis, when you tell a patient that you have a broken bone or lysis, this is, this is, and usually these are children, frequently these are children, this is what the mother sees in her, in her mind. Disaster, when you say something's fractured. That makes sense, right? You say mm -hmm. something in my children's spine is fractured. This is what the, going through the mother's head, which is quite understandable, right? Yes. So this is what spondylolysis. Spondylo means, again, spine. And lysis is something broken. So there's actually a fracture in the spine. And when you hear like your spine's fractured, it's terrifying, right? It's between where the this facet and this facet, the facet above and the facet below. So it's the place of the pars between the joints. This is a joint. These two bones come together. This is a joint, and you have a fracture right here. This same uh, part of the spine is called the isthmus. Why? An isthmus is like a narrow. This is CoPP. You remember CoPP? I do. It's a small, narrow area of spine that collects that connects two big, large masses of land. So you can imagine like this small area connects this large area and this large area. And that's why they call it the isthmus of the spine. So I like to do illustrative cases. So this is a 16-year-old national, nationally ranked level club soccer player. And he has low back pain. And here are his x-rays, AP, front view, side view, lateral view. And the squares are the vertebral bodies, the bones. They're normal. They line up. This bone looks normal, normal in this bone. These are totally normal x-rays, 16-year-old, healthy. The MRI scan at L4 shows increased signal, the pedicles. See how this is a little bit bright? This is a little bit bright? It kind of, it's unclear what that is. It's a non-specific finding. Here's a sagittal cut or a side cut you can see here the pedicle is just bright see how this area is brighter than this area mm -hmm. see it so this is a non-specific finding there's nothing wrong with the patient's pedicle the problem is he has a pars fracture and this area has increased stress and it's bright this is a totally normal MRI normal vertebral bodies bones normal discs the disc is nice and bright black on the outside bright on the inside meaning it has water this is where the spinal canal and the nerves run. Cerebral spinal fluid is bright. This is just another view. But here, again, you can see that this L4 pedicle is somewhat bright. It's kind of a nonspecific finding. Now, this is a bone scan. A bone scan is when you insert dye into the patient's body, and it circulates through the whole body. And if there's a fracture or a tumor or an infection, it lights up. Now, this is a 16-year-old, so his growth plates light up. This is where the child grows. Uh, this is a big area of growth around the knee. So he's growing through his knees. He's growing through his shoulders. He's going through his spine a little bit. But can you see these, these two bright areas right here at L4? That's where he has a fracture. He has a pars fracture. And these are just CT cuts. You can see that there's a fracture here. There's a bright, bright area in the spine where there shouldn't be. Now, the best way to know that there's a fracture of the pars is a CT. And you can see see that line right across there? Mm -hmm. That's the fracture line of the pars. And you can't really see it well on this view. So it's a fracture of the spine and the patient has pain. So you have any um, ideas about what to do? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Mm -hmm. So I mean, basically, these things heal by themselves. So what you have to tell the patient, and really, really difficult, is to tell them to stop playing soccer. 
And to tell a 16-year-old national level soccer player, to tell him to play, stop playing soccer at the club level where the parents are paying a tremendous amount of money, training, time that they've invested, it's really hard to get this child to stop playing soccer. But that's basically what he has to do. He has to rest. And if the child rests, this fracture will heal. Now, there's also some evidence that if you brace the child, put them in a brace, they heal as well. I'm not so sure it's the brace that heals, the, the actual plastic thing that's on his body that makes it heal, or just the fact he stops playing soccer. Because you can't play soccer when you wear a brace. Now, this is called the thoracolumbosacral orthosis. And, and really, to make that spine not move, to immobilize it, you need to include the thigh. And nobody wants to wear this thing. This thing is like really incapacitating. But this is really, really what you really have to do to make that area stiff so it doesn't move. But nobody tolerates a thigh cuff. So usually most people just prescribe the TLSO, the thoracolumbosacral arthrosis, although it doesn't immobilize the spine. The spine keeps moving. But what it does, it stops the patient from playing soccer and just makes them rest. So he was 10 months later, that thing totally healed. And I don't get CAT scans on patients, especially children, because there's a radi uh, um, risk of radiation to the child. But the mother was very adamant that she wanted this CAT scan. Hmm. And she told me if I wasn't going to do it, somebody else would do it. So I got it. She wanted to prove that it was healed so he can go back to soccer. But I told her if he doesn't feel pain, he should just play. But this is proof that these things do heal. It took 10 months. So we're going to talk about these fractures. This is a case of a fracture. And here's, here's what it looks like. That's a pars fracture. So facts about pars fractures. Pars fractures are very common. 5% of all children have it at age six. I mean, that's a lot of people. So you have a class of 20 children. One of those children, normal children, one of those children in that classroom has a pars fracture. It's very, very common. Uh, in adults, it's about six to 10%. Uh, so usually I think around 13, 14, that's when you get this prevalence. Humans are the only ones that get pars fractures. No other animal gets a pars fracture. Do you have any theories? So far, that only humans get it. It's kind of weird, right? No other animal gets it. Yeah. If you don't walk, you never get a pars fracture. So there are patients who never walk, who are born without a spinal cord or something like that. They never get a pars fracture, ever. So what are you thinking now? Why? Just standing upright? Yeah, exactly. The upright position. I'm going to show you why. Eskimos or Inuits have a 50% incidence of pars fracture in some studies. Half, which is like 10 times. And we're going to talk about that too. There are also contributory behaviors that cause pars fractures. And where in the spine, the most common is at the very bottom one, L5. So this, have you ever seen this before? Have I, I have. Okay. I won't go into it then. But here's a human, gorilla, I think chimpanzee and orangutan. And you can see that we're the only upright um, primate, really. All these other guys are not upright. They put th their weight on their arms. So that's why we're so unique. And almost all animals are on all fours. And their spine, the bottom part of the spine is kind of round, like a round back. But I, and this is my Spiro's theory, okay? Spiro's theory of uh, spine problems. Because we walk upright, the only animal that walks upright, it freed up our hands to do tremendous things with our hands. But who paid the price? Our lower back paid the price because we have an abnormal shape to our lumbar spine, to our lower back. Mm -hmm. Interesting, right? Yeah. So why do the Inuits have a 50% incidence of pars fractures? Some people say it's genetic, and there is a, definitely a genetic component, but it may be that they do a lot of work bending down. They put a lot of force on their spine when they uh, clean uh, animals and things like that and cut ice. So what happens when you, when you bend backwards? This is L5. When you, when you put extension or, or you, like you go backwards with your spine, you compress this part and you put tension on this part and it puts a lot of force on the spine. And the bottom area, like the bottom of a, uh, tower has the most force. You can imagine if you have a, a big tower, the very bottom has the most force on it. Mm -hmm. So you put a lot of force on the bottom of the spine. So here's the activities 
of uh, this is extension or backwards. Like gymnasts have a tremendous amount of extension to the spine. Uh, divers, offensive linemen, you can see all the stress. He's going backwards blocking. Wrestling, because they stand up. And also rowers. And these, the people, and they're usually children, but some adult, you know, they go into adulthood. But these children have three times the incidence of pars fractures. Interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Um, now, one more contributor is pelvic incidence. I won't get into pelvic incidence, but the shape of the pelvis dictates how much you have to stand up straight. So people are just shaped a little different. And some people have weird shapes to their pelvis that makes their lower back more of a sway back. And that puts more stress. The other interesting thing about these pars fractures is some people just have a crack, but some people it elongates and it deforms. And what happens when it elongates, it keeps trying to heal. It's really interesting. So this is this is a case of elongation of the fracture. Like this point used to be here, but it just it keeps getting longer and longer from the force of gravity and it tries to heal itself. Here's an x-ray. This is a normal right here. You see how there's a break right here? There's a pars fracture. This is an oblique x-ray. Some patients, when they get the fracture, the bones slide and cause serious problems. Now, sometimes they slide and cause no problems, but sometimes it slides and it compresses the nerve roots. But not all patients, not all patients, when they have this fracture, they slide. And most patients have no symptoms whatsoever. In fact, most people go their entire lives and never know they had this fracture. So you can see the bottom of the spine here. You see how it's not like a raccoon? See how it's backwards? And, and most of the backwards of the lordosis of the lumbar spine is at the very base. Um, can you compare, like, compare this spine to the, like, this spine? Yeah. See the, see the base is not going backwards, it's going forwards here? Mm -hmm. Like, and here, it's going uh, back, hold on, it's going backwards. And most of the, and th this backwards uh, uh, alignment is called lordosis. Kyphosis is forwards, lordosis is backwards. You can see that in this part. This part goes forwards, this part goes backwards. And specifically, the most lordosis is in the very bottom of the spine, L5-S1 and L4-L5. This is from a study in, uh, I think it was in France. But the bottom two levels have the most lordosis, and that's why the bottom two levels have the highest incidence of these pars fractures, because there's so much stress, backwards stress in the bottom of the spine. And this is just another idea is like the shape of the pelvis and the spine. Uh, some people have more stress than others. And first degree relatives have a 25% incidence. If you have a first degree uh, relative who has the same problem, you have a very high incidence of getting it, like say 25%. Of, and 4% of these fractures slide, which can be more of a problem. It's called spondylolisthesis. It usually just presents as back pain. Sometimes the, the nerves are tight and the patients have hamstring tightness. And you can, you can on physical exam, when you lay the patient flat and bend the knee up, most children can get their knee totally straight. But if they have hamstring tightness, it could be a sign of either nerve root tension or this problem. Now, how do you image it? You can get x-rays, you can get a CAT scan, which has a lot of radiation, a bone scan, which has a lot of radiation, or an MRI. MRI is not the best test, but because it has no radiation, it's the first line because you don't want to irradiate a child. You know, long term, 20, 30 years down the line, there's an incidence of cancer, you know, increases the probability of cancer if you irradiate children. This finding on the x ray, we call it Scotty Dog. Here, this is a Scotty Dog, and you see how the Scotty Dog has a collar? Mm -hmm. So, this is the ear of the Scotty Dog, this is the nose, this is the neck, this is the front foot, this is the back foot. Mm -hmm. So if you can, in your mind's eye, when you see the x-ray, you think of a Scotty dog, the fracture would be at the neck where the Scotty dog has a collar. That's what we call Scotty dog sign. Just another cartoon so you understand it. See how that looks like a Scotty dog. Oops. And the fracture would be right where the collar would be. That's a 45 degree oblique. And usually, though, you can see the fracture on x-ray. You see that black line? Mm -hmm. So you can obviously see it on the side view. So usually you don't need the oblique view. This is the this is the 45 degree oblique view. Usually you can see it on the lateral view, the side view. So I, I rarely get oblique views just because there's more radiation for the patient. I can usually tell on the side view. 
So we, re, we said this again, you get pedicular edema. If you see in a child edema in the pedicle, you have to think pars fracture. And we would discuss bone scan. Bone scan lights up and makes it easy to diagnose. It's another view of the bone scan. Now, some of these patients have pain because the pars fracture is right over the nerve root, specifically the dorsal root ganglion of the nerve root. And if this gets inflamed, it can give them leg pain. This is, this is a very sensitive part of the nerve. I won't get into that. Uh, I won't get into that. Now, one thing that can masquerade as a pars fracture on bone scan is a benign tumor that's, that is in childhood called osteodysioma. This is not malignant. It's not a cancer. But it is extremely bright on the bone scan, and it causes pain. So this could masquerade as uh, as a pars fracture. This has to be in your mind, but it's, it's not common. Now, there are surgeries for pars fractures. I've never done one. I, every single child that I have seen has gotten better with rest. So personally, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, but people have described it, and I'm it probably works. But I think pars fractures happen due to behavioral activities and also genetic predisposition. So because of those two reasons, I don't think surgery is the best option. I think changing behaviors is a better option. But you can put a direct screw across it. You can, you can uh, wire it and put bone graft, or you can put a pedicle screw and a hook. Here's, here's a pedicle screw with a hook. And here's the direct interlaminar screws. Uh, you can do these percutaneous. Basically, it's a screw across the fracture. But the problem is this screw, yeah, the, the fracture will heal, but because of the behavior, it'll fracture again, and then the screw will fail. And this is the last resort. Like, you can fuse the spine, fuse that segment. Now, this is a big surgery. Um, and it's, it's, I, I've rarely done it for these cases. Now... This is, you see the fracture here. If you're going to fuse the spine and the spine's sliding, the typical surgery is it's called a gill laminectomy. You take this bone off, and after you take this bone off, you can track out the L5 nerve root and fully free it up. Usually in these pars fractures, it's not clean like this. There's all this extra bone material compressing the nerve roots. So you have to do this gill laminectomy to make sure the nerve roots are free, and this is a fusion of that level. You have any questions so far? If they heal just with the rest, pars fractures, yeah. yeah. Let's say the pars fracture heals, then does the child get it again? Yeah, exactly. If they that's go back to soccer. Yeah, that's just the problem because frequently it's a genetic predisposition and it's behavioral activity. So they do happen again. Mm. So it's a very hard thing, well, you know, hard thing to deal with, how to manage, because you never know what to do. The child wants to play football. The child wants to play soccer. Their back hurts. I mean, I usually just let symptoms dictate things. I say, look, if you're hurting a lot, you shouldn't be playing. Um, the problem is the child wants to play. Yeah. So is it, I think it's a very difficult tightrope uh, for the parent, for the doctor, and for the child. But I think you can manage it. Okay, that's a good question. Any other questions? That's a good question. Oh, no. Okay, so this is another case, 61-year-old. So this is not a child. This is a, like an adult um, with right sciatica. Two, it has had two opinions, and both people said you have to do a fusion. But this patient found a friend on the golf course that said, I did a small surgery for the on the spine, and it helped the, the, the patient's spine tremendously. Um, so he was kind of referred through a golf friend. It's kind of interesting. The x-rays are kind of normal. Uh, when he bends forwards and backwards, there's no abnormal motion, but you can see he has a pars fracture. And see, it's obvious broken, right? Mm -hmm. Looks bad. Uh, and you can see the MRI. So, I mean, really, this is a axial cuts L1, L1, L2, L2, L3, 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 L4, L4, L5. And you can see his pars fracture right here. It's, it's a pretty good one. Uh, and he has extra um, bone formation there because the fracture is trying to heal and it was compressing his nerve root. Now, the typical treatment for this is you remove that bone. Remember we talked about the gill laminectomy? You remove the bone, completely free up the nerve. Now it's really loose and you have to fuse it, which is a big surgery. You have to put screws across it and fuse it with the bone graft. But 
Another option is just drill open the area for the nerve. Don't remove the whole bone. Just find the nerve and, and free it up, which is what I did for this patient. I just decompressed him. I decompressed multiple levels, but this is the one I was worried about. And this, this is my notes from the surgery. It took me two hours, 15 minutes. And here's where his pars fracture was. And this was loose. And I just opened it up. And I told the patient, look, this may not work. You may need the big surgery. And you may need a fusion. But he's like, I'm, I'm ready to deal with the uncertainty of a failure. But I don't want a big operation. So I said, okay, well, if you're okay with this failing and needing the fusion later, let's do it. And uh, he did fine. I mean, he's, he's like eight years. That was, he's 10 years out now. I blocked the name out. Mm. So this is one more case. This is a 30-year-old man, like a young man with low back pain, left hip numbness. He's an IT analyst. His, he has just a tiny bit of sliding, but you can see the bars fracture. Mm -hmm. And this is at L3, L4, which is higher. See, this? It's, like a, it's like a big fracture here. And uh, you can see his obvious fracture right here at L3. MRI looks pretty normal, but you can see the edema right here. All right, just a second, let me get here. So this view is pretty normal. Axial cut's normal. But in this case, this patient had a lot of back pain and a lot of leg pain. He was young. And I did not think, because every, the rest of his spine was very normal, I think there was too much stress on this spine. So I did the gill laminectomy and I fused it. And um, I mean, he did great. But I didn't think a small surgery would work. Like separate from the older person. So you can see here the screws across the spine and all this bone material is fusing these two levels so they never move again. This guy went, did fantastic. I saw him, I saw him at the grocery store the other day. He was really happy. That's it, pars fractures. So you have any questions about pars fractures? Well, it's very interesting though. All right, thanks.